All right, so welcome everyone. Thank you for coming um, to this session on accessibility at Oswego. We decided to hold this session in part to kind of catch everyone up at the wide variety of activities that have been happening on campus related to accessibility and to give everyone kind of an overview of what's going on and also the wide variety of people who are involved in this initiative on campus. So this is an opportunity to kind of see some faces and, and see who some of these folks are and um, know who you can connect with in the future about any of your accessibility questions. And we have a lot of uh, folks that are gonna join us on the panel today. I'm gonna get us started. Um, so here we go. So our objectives for this session are to introduce uh, the Campus Accessibility Initiative and also our accessibility plan, which you may or may not know that we have. Um, and we're gonna introduce a wide variety of people and resources associated with accessibility um, that can help you meet your accessibility responsibilities as a member of our campus community. The way that we think about accessibility or the way that we're talking about accessibility in this session is specifically digital accessibility. Obviously, there's other kinds of accessibility, right? Like you might think of ramps and um, having accessible doors, et cetera. But in this case, we're talking specifically about digital accessibility, meaning that any of our electronic documents, whether they're videos or audio files or Word documents, web pages, et cetera, all of those meet accessibility standards. And we specifically follow the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0 AA standard. Um, the way that we think about digital accessibility is that it's equity centered, meaning that everyone has kind of an equal playing field to access the content and use the content. Um, in particular, digital accessibility and in following these guidelines helps folks with disabilities have the same access as everyone else because the documents are structured and set up in a way that allows them to use assistive technology um, to get all the content that they want. And that extends to everybody because now we can all use our devices um, to access content in different ways. Digital accessibility is a proactive approach, meaning that it's not because we know someone has a disability that we're making things accessible, rather that we're preemptively making everything accessible so that all folks can use it. And then finally, we also think about digital accessibility, accessibility in terms of the legal requirement that we have as an institution that gets federal funding. So there are multiple laws in which we are bound under to make sure our materials that we're sharing within our campus community are accessible. So accessibility has been a part of our campus uh, much earlier than 2014, but as we're thinking about our kind of current digital accessibility initiatives, uh, we can look at May of 2014 as, as a time when CELT really started offering workshops on accessibility um, as part of the spring breakout sessions and continues to winter and spring the following year, et cetera. In 2016, uh, CELT started working with um, our instructional designers and extended learning and the work group on accessibility practices essentially was founded at that time. And I'll pass it over to Sean to walk us through the rest of the timeline. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Rebecca. And I think actually, uh, so in around July 2017, uh, Rick Buck and received a OCR complaint uh, about our website. And really that set off uh, really kind of six months of us going and ensuring that our website was compliant. And uh, our goal at that point was to uh, go and not only get the website to be compliant for the uh, OCR, uh, like at that one point in time, but to make sure that we set processes to keep it compliant all the time, which was a uh, requirement. So we worked diligently and I, that's uh, kind of like the royal we because Rick and his team did a tremendous amount of work over that period of time. But we also uh, purchased some new software such as Site Improve to help us go and become compliant. And we really kept the energy going once we uh, settled with the OCR in December of 2017 and just decided we really didn't want to be in this position again. 
And this is where we had the accessibility steering. And as uh, Rebecca would say, this is kind of where the uh, grassroots group of people met with the upper, you know, with administration and coming down. And we put these different groups of um, people together and we started the accessibility steering. And I know there's more slides about that to follow. In June 29, SUNY I think we lost you. Had, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. my internet connection is unstable. So I'm going to turn the video. Sorry about that. I'll just go like this. I'll just say I'm in Ontario right internet. I don't know how life continues during those periods of time, but uh, that's how it's been. So I'll just turn the video off and go with that. Uh, June 2019, you see there was a SUNY-wide policy. And really the SUNY-wide policy is really no different than what we were trying to accomplish here at Oswego. And just last month, we put in our SUNY Oswego uh, access. I'll call it our digital accessibility plan, but it's something really we've been working on for the last, uh, the, the actual wording in the plan. We've been working on for eight or nine months going ever since, you know, we started with that July 2017 OCR complaint. In terms of what the, the, um, you know, how we go and look at whether we're reaching our accessibility standards and what's expected. There are, in essence, worldwide standards that we go in and utilize to, uh, you know, to evaluate what we're doing. And they're on the web, digital content, which, uh, you know, would generally be the documents that we're creating, what we're doing inside the classroom, and how we're offering, uh, you know, the environment that students are, have. The library is also involved. And how we go about procurement, particularly to ensure that we are purchasing applications and digital assets that are accessible and having a process to go in to ensure that, um, you know, what, what we have and buy is going to be easy to implement and meet our standards. Go. And we're going to pass it over to Annika. Everyone, um, I know Rodman wanted to be here today, but I think he has a President's Council meeting. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to share um, some of the things we're doing and thinking about in our office. Uh, first of all, um, I want to say that ability, disability are a part of how the institution defines diversity. Uh, and we do direct work to support accessibility um, through Rodman's participation on the Digital Access Steering Committee. I think Re Rebecca is going to talk about that more later. Um, our office also supports the diversity committees in each school, again, with the understanding that ability, disability are a dimension of diversity. Um, we're almost done with a website redesign. I've been happily working away with Kelly Ariel. Um, and a part of that, the work that we wanted to do there was just to highlight um, accessibility resources and work. Uh, and that, that information already lives on the website. Everyone's been very thorough. But again, just to kind of invite people into it through the diversity portal to say, this is important to us. And this is, we think of this as a part of our work. Um, across the campus, we've been uh, doing workshops and trainings, uh, and really deal with ability and disability in that through, through our topics that are related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So um, I think, you know, leading up to this moment, we've been talking about how, and I think we'll talk more about how, but also a legal why. Um, and I think in our trainings from our office, we're dealing with a more um, fundamental why. So uh, a starting point often for us is talking about uh, intersectional, social, intersectional social identities, um, again, with ability disability as a dimension of that. Uh, we also talk about um, implicit bias, stereotypes, and microaggressions specific to ableism. 
uh, and work with folks on how to recognize them, respond to them, or intervene in, in, in those types of microaggressions. Uh, and we've also been talking a lot about cultural humility, um, which I think is particularly relevant because it emphasizes learning from people rather than um, assigning characteristics or experiences. So even if you're thinking about this idea of access, you know, to let people tell you what, what they need to access information. Um, so uh, all of that relates to our understanding of ability and disability and how to kind of um, help our campus uh, understand it as well. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs> so as you may have already kind of got the feeling, it really takes a village to make a big initiative like this happen. Um, and so there are multiple groups on campus um, that are working together um, in addition to the diversity office that we just heard from. And that includes the digital accessibility steering committee that Sean mentioned a bit ago. Um, the work group on accessibility practices that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, there's a web steering committee um, providing guidance over the website. There's a remediation team, faculty accessibility fellows, a digital accessibility analyst, and then everyone that's a member of our community is also part of this general campus effort. So we're going to dive into each of these um, individual groups and responsibilities um, as we move forward now. So we'll hand it back over to Sean. Okay, and I'm back on camera. The uh, So one thing I would say is uh, if you're really going to show a commitment, you need to put resources and time and energy towards. And I think that's the one thing that we can uh, really be proud of. I think the reason that we've moved so far compared to other schools is because we've truly made it a priority and we put resources. We're blessed to have outstanding people. Uh, Rebecca and Kate come to mind immediately as uh, examples of how we've gone and um, you know got uh, you know put time towards it. Uh, have excellent teachers who are willing to share, and then like the quantity of work that Kate's done, and also uh, really what Rick's done in terms of the website, in terms of making sure that we're good. So let's just go to, how do I, uh, have you got to forward it for me? Um, I think I just did. Did I go far enough? Uh, diversity committee, I need to call, um, is it not working? Is there, so right now, what I see is the ability, uh, the collaboration to support function philosophy with digital accessibility steering committee, diversity committee, DEI workshops with students. Hmm. Okay. Does everybody else see something different? I thought we were on the digital accessibility steering committee slide. Is that what everybody else sees or no? That's what I see. Okay. Uh, hang oh, on a second. I mean, the, the slide is the second. Oh. Now with it. There we go. Set direction and go. So the digital accessibility. Now I see it. Uh, digital accessibility steering committee. What we do is set direction and goals, and really, in terms of going and developing the plan, uh, that's what we've done. And really, we break up the meetings to do a little bit of work on what we're working on right now and what do we want to accomplish and what does the future uh, look like and develop policy and process. We really focus a lot in terms on process in terms of policy. Largely, we're living within uh, the laws that are already existing and the uh, policy that is that SUNY has out there. We really don't necessarily need to do too much policy here. And uh, I, I do really go back into the resources that we put forward to ensure that we have, you know, we can do process. Um, and I include the faculty fellows in that group too. All right, for the next, there we go. So, whoops, you had a slide. Okay, I'll hand it over there. I didn't see the slide with all the pictures on it, but that's Oh, cool. I did that one first. Yeah, I missed it. That's okay, I'm okay. good. All right. <laughs> so, um, 
Dan was originally going to do this section, but was unable to um, attend. So um, I'm going to cover this section. So we have our work group on accessibility practices, which we mentioned um, started really early on in our effort, and it includes folks from a wide variety of areas. So we've got faculty representation and members of the faculty fellows who are on the committee, our digital accessibility analyst, um, marketing communication services, CTS, accessibility services, uh, the library, extended learning. Um, so it's, it's a big group um, of a wide variety of folks who are working together. Um, and I think it's that diversity of different people from different fields and expertise that really make uh, this, this group so strong and so helpful. Um, we've been working together as a group to work on our accessibility webpage. And if you haven't been to our accessibility website, which is oswego.edu slash accessibility, um, you should definitely check it out. It's got all kinds of resources, tutorials, um, information about the accessibility initiative and each of these groups, as well as who chairs each of these committees and things if you need to get in contact with somebody. So a good, easy URL to remember. Um, our work group has been working on a wide variety of things, including the website, but also uh, put together a wide variety of CELT workshops for you um, this winter, but have been doing on a consistent basis in winter and summer and spring breakout sessions. Um, as you've all seen, the launch of our first 10-day accessibility challenge starts today, and I know some of you are um, participants in that challenge and have joined us today to learn more about how that fits into our bigger um, initiatives. So we hope to do more of those, but our first one starts today and kind of coincides with the winter breakouts. And our group has also been actively involved in kind of consultations with individual faculty and departments about their own individual needs um, and have conducted research kind of as needed um, as things have come up. So um, when tricky kind of sticky situations come up um, about accessibility and how to handle things or um, maybe what the best approach is, it often comes to the work group who works together to come up with solutions or find some other additional experts to reach out to for information. Um, does Kate or Michelle want to chime in with anything else I might have missed? I think you covered pretty much everything, Rebecca. Um, I don't really have anything else to add. I'll talk a little bit more about both remediation and like the education pieces that kind of fall under the work group, but I don't have anything else specific to add right now. Okay. So I'll pass it over to Rick. Hi, so yeah, the web steering committee was um, established. Uh, Sean helped uh, create that group. Um, and one of the main focuses uh, that we initially took a look at was um, some template changes and things that we wanted to make to the website moving forward. And um, so we, <clears throat> before we move forward with those changes, we propose them to this group, go through, make sure that we're not, you know, really kind of missing anything. And um, just, you know, to ensure that we're making sure that the site is as inclusive as it can, can possibly be for, for all audiences. Um, some of the most recent things that we've done, I think as some of you probably noticed, <laughs> we made some pretty substantial changes to the navigation and whatnot of the website. Um, and started introducing some new components and some other some other items. Um, so really, the, the big decisions that we make regarding the website, we um, you know work with with this group and just to ensure again that that everything is remaining accessible and inclusive and uh, on target for for all audiences. Thanks, Rick. I don't know if Sean wants to add anything, but <laughs> no, no, I think that's good. All right, we'll hand it to Kate. Okay, great. Um, yes, as Rebecca mentioned, part of the remediation team, um, I work very closely with both Carrie Mosick from uh, Extended Learning, and she's an instructional designer with Extended Learning, and Star Wheeler of Accessibility Resources. A uh, brief overview of our process when the student registers with Accessibility Resources. Star enters them into Banner, and then a report is generated that identifies courses that have a student enrolled who needs accessible course materials. Um, Carrie is the contact person for the faculty whose courses are on that report. 
she sent out communication to those faculty explaining the process, why their course was flagged, and a little bit of background of what we're doing about it. And then I'm responsible for remediating course documents that fall below the accessibility standards um, to be placed online. So just to give you sort of a, a frame of reference, prior to this past semester, my average course load was about 20 courses that I would have to assess and remediate. Um, in fall of 2020, we all knew this was going to be a different beast, right? There were over 200 courses on that report. And as of right now, as of this morning, spring 21 has about 100 courses on that report. Um, so it's obviously digital accessibility is very important. It's important that we get faculty cooperation. Um, and having such a large course load is quite unsustainable, as you could imagine. So it's also very important that um, we help faculty take responsibility for the accessibility of their own materials. Um, and that sort of plays into this DIY program uh, creation that, that the work group has um, developed. So, um, so that's a little bit about the remediation team. Um, if anyone has any questions about remediation, you're welcome to reach out to me um, after this presentation, obviously. And, and I am happy to work with people to kind of help them get a handle of things because it can be very tricky and very difficult. But that's, uh, that's what Carrie and Star and I do. We try to, uh, as Rebecca says here in the slide, prioritize um, courses for the remediation and then provide assistance when necessary. Thanks, Kate. We'll pass it over to Michelle. Thanks, Rebecca. And thanks, uh, Kate. So um, my name is Michelle Thornton. I am the Faculty Accessibility Fellow Coordinator for this year. And you can see um, myself um, as part of a much larger cohort of folks that have gone through the fellow program, which started in 2019. Um, each year we have four to five faculty members participate in the fellowship. And um, while we think about Kate's team, the remediation team as being sort of reactive, right? Like finding out and responding to, um, to specific needs from specific students in specific courses, the fellowship program works a little bit more proactively. And this is really, I think, where we are attempting to um, train faculty members to create content for their courses with accessibility in mind from the beginning. Um, regardless of who uh, the students are in those courses, is to really kind of make sure that the content that they're creating um, for the digital courses um, or in their course in their classrooms in general um, is accessible and uh, comes from a perspective of universal design for learning. Um, and this, I think, really gets at that idea that Rebecca was talking about with being equity centered. So um, the fellows certainly work on um, their own courses and, and kind of building skill sets to be able to do that. But they also are really kind of um, like ambassadors out um, into their departments and schools across campus to be a resource um, or a liaison for um, kind of building that network of, of kind of the accessibility culture across campus. And so they do do some coaching, some mentoring, participate certainly in uh, providing sessions through CELT and, and as well as, you know, meetings directly in departments. Um, the other thing that the fellows uh, are sort of charged with doing is to uh, kind of getting the word out beyond, beyond campus. And, and that is, you know, presenting within their own disciplines. Uh, many of the fellows have started incorporating principles of accessibility into their research agendas. Um, and we really, I think, as we continue to kind of build this group of, of fellows, that role continues to expand and, and how, uh, what they're able to be doing and how they're able to build that, um, I think, culture across campus. Uh, is, is really exciting and unique um, piece of the of the program that uh, is something I think uh, pretty unique here at Oswego. This is not something that we see um, in other places and uh, I got to give a lot of credit to, to Sean and Rebecca for continuing to support this and to kind of con having conceived of it a few years ago uh, as part of the broader accessibility efforts across campus. Thank you. And I'll pass it back to Kate. Hi again. Um, so there's two basic sides of the digital accessibility analyst position. There's the remediation side, which I just spoke about, 
And then there's the education side, which as Michelle said, um, is kind of the more proactive side of things, helping to um, get ahead of the game. Um, there tends to be this misconception about the definition of accessibility and how it pertains to each of us. Um, so part of shifting the culture on our campus is going to come from sort of leveling out that misunderstanding and providing clear information on what accessibility is and how it is achieved. Um, and that's starting to shift. Um, mainly, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that everybody was thrown into the fire so quickly with all of the COVID mess that happened last year. Um, prior to that, uh, because of the misconception, I think oftentimes people who need accessibility information don't always know that they do. Um, and when everything went remote so quickly, I think there was like this collaborative realization that accessibility really means much more than people tend to think it means. Um, so uh, again, that plays into all of this here at Oswego with the, the various groups and um, all of the efforts that are being put into being more of the proactive side of accessibility rather than the reactive side. So the education part of my job um, aims to help teach and train people about accessibility and how to incorporate it. And this involves things like creating the accessibility website, many of the resources that are within that website, um, including the written and video tutorials. Um, there's an FAQ page. There's, uh, as Rebecca mentioned in the beginning, there's lots of um, resources and tips and tools. I worked with the work group to develop the 10 day accessibility challenge, um, which again, part of you are participants in um, that actually had a huge response. We were quite surprised and pleased to say the least. Um, and we do plan to roll out more of these DIY type programs um, in the future, hopefully. And I also lead workshops and presentations um, such as the breakout sessions over the next two weeks. And I'm happy to connect with people kind of one-on-one -on -one and, um, and answer specific questions that they had. So, so there's a lot of it. It's very opposite in some ways, the remediation and the education parts, um, but they do really fit together. Um, and it's, it's a great feeling to be able to um, introduce people and support people um, and kind of continuing the efforts that we have here at Us We Go. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. So now we're gonna shift a little bit towards um, talking about the Campus Accessibility Plan and its components. And I'm gonna pass that to Sean. Okay, the uh, Accessibility Plan has really a number of components. Um, and I've already talked about the benchmarks and how we go and categorize them in those five areas and how we use standards to do it. But another component of it is how we outline the responsibilities of the different constituents. And I guess when I think about what we're really trying to achieve here on campus is that we want to enable all the faculty, administration and students to create and the digital content in essence on their own. Kate talked about the tremendous lift it's been as we've moved to this, uh, you know, largely remote instruction mm -hmm. and the number of courses that have needed to go and to have um, needed some kind of remediation. But I think when we think of a plan, and even when we look back at it years ago, we really wanted to ensure that people inside their roles, first of all, understood what accessibility was, what their role inside of it was, and how they would want to go and, um, in essence, create and support the initiative, and then make sure that they have the knowledge and the skills in order to do it. And that's what we've really tried to do in terms of the structure of everything that we've done. So outlining the responsibilities of the different constituents is really to go and to assist them to understand their part in, uh, in supporting accessibility. So I know I added a whole bunch of slides, I think. Everyone plays a role. So we talk about the public digital materials, um, digital course materials, official department communication, and how we go and procure. So each one of these has different components. And we've really been 
working, I would say, diligently in different areas to go and to support them. So when I think of public digital materials, I think of items where uh, we might be having PDFs and we might have gone and created print material and we might post those in areas back in the time when people would walk around campus and wander through hallways and look at things that are on the board. But I think back then, one of the other items that we used to do was go and just take those materials and then just put them up on the web. And that might have been fast and easy in a way, but actually it wasn't fast and it wasn't necessarily that easy and it was bad practice in order to go in and do that. So I think those kinds of items we've gone and uh, really tried to put in processes to go into help and that would fall to the web team in there. Digital course materials. I mean, certainly I think everybody on here understands what that is and that's what Kate's been talking a lot about. When I think of official departmental communication, really that even includes items like, uh, so when we send out an email, I think we've, uh, you know, made great strides and we just don't throw another PDF out there, you know, and go and reuse content like that. We go and send accessible emails. I know even items like sending out the Christmas email card you know, going and trying to ensure that those are done in an accessible way. Uh, and I think we've made great strides in terms of that. And then in terms around procurement, I would say this is among the most difficult items uh, to do. The quantity of work to go in to ensure that we're uh, purchasing um, digital accessible digital platform software. I think we've done work in terms of uh, going and when we do RFPs and on larger items, ensuring that the wording in the RFPs is there. In terms of how well we've done in terms of making sure that the uh, software is accessible, it's just so much work it's really a work in progress i would say and dealing with the vendors and vendors are far more aware of the requirements that we have and depending on the size of the platform we're talking about um you know we're, we're making strides but we're moving slowly and we're trying to do it in a suny manner where we can support one another because uh the quantity of work here is so large go to the next slide and I think I've talked about this, like we've, we've tried to broke it up into these different areas. So go to the next slide, Rebecca. So here, when I think of our, uh, the roles and responsibilities, and really this is senior administration and administration, whether it's the deans, department chairs, uh, everyone, you know, ensure that we have this campus commitment to go and create accessible content. Uh, and ensure that people think when they send the uh, content out, whether it's from an email, put something on the web, however they go and communicate with uh, one another, even, even when you're, uh, if you still have a Twitter account, if you tweet, you know, we've done work in terms of going and making sure that, uh, you know, we, we have the processes to, um, to create accessible content there. And then, at this point, I'd just be happy if when people make purchases in their area, they realize that we need to go and take uh, digital content and accessibility into consideration when we buy that software. All of those uh, items do end up coming back to CTS and we do check them. But I think uh, understanding that this adds time to the process is important. So then there's all the items really that fall to me and really it's to ensure, but luckily it's not me because it's really the digital accessibility steering committee. And, uh, you know, we go and design and plan for accessibility, communication of the shared responsibility of the plan, which I think really is, this is an excellent example of it. I think, uh, Rebecca and the whole team for all that she did to go in to make this happen. And then, like anything else at us, we go on Insight SUNY, we'll make sure that we go back and assess 
our plan and how how we're moving forward with it and our um, accessibility um, initiatives on campus. So here we talk about the administrative offices and that includes the dean's offices and uh, department chairs. Really it's ensuring that you provide accessible and inclusive digital materials. And it really does go back to the website. I'm pretty sure the next one is around web officers and what uh, web editors and what they have. Yes, it does. Really, it's to ensure that there's accessibility and everything that's on the web. And I think uh, particularly right now as we go and move uh, Drupal, uh, move from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, that we will we have a chance to go and a clean up all the content and get rid of the thousands and thousands of pdfs that we have and uh, also to make sure that we uh, give people the knowledge to go and to manage their uh, their content and ensure that it's accessible as we move forward and then inside it also means that uh, we provide reasonable accommodations uh, Rick and Kate and the team have uh, spots on the web where people can request for accommodations or if they find anything that's wrong on the website to have it, uh, you know, that you can you send a note and say, I found a mistake. And we expect people to go back and to clean up, uh, you know, non-accessible content on, an, on a timely basis. And when I think of interfacing with accessible external websites, often we'll have links to other websites and ensuring that uh, those websites that we're sending people to are accessible as well. I'm going to ask Rick if he wants to talk about the responsibilities of the uh, web administrators here and I how. <clears throat> I think you pretty much covered it. Um, you know, the accessibility of the individual website, most of the time um, accessibility issues are regarding the content that's actually on the site, the template and everything else that is built into the CMS and the way the site looks, those have all been tuned for accessibility. Um, but if you're uploading a Word document or a PDF or, um, you know, even when you're just making general edits to the website, um, those responsibilities for the accessibility all rely really with whoever is uh, the administrator for that site. So it's either the director or chair, whoever else um, that, that is in charge. Uh, if we find an, you know, something that's inaccessible, we'll let the site owners know. Um, and if it's pretty glaring, we'll usually just fix it and let them know that, that we've corrected it. Um, the other thing that we're working on doing is providing um, uh, reports to the site owners so that they know which areas of their site have some issues and that we need them to review. And then also what actions that, uh, what steps they can take to, to correct those. Um, I think that's, I think that's- Now I know as we roll out the new website, we're looking to include site improve and to give people feedback and assessment and help them to keep an eye, an eye on their website too. Um, there was a question in here, Debbie Quick asked if, um, you know, how do we know if a website meets accessibility standards? Um, so <clears throat> one thing that we will be providing when we migrate a site and we still have to kind of get it up and running are these uh, monthly reports, which will automatically be sent to the site owner to let them know kind of what their accessibility score is for the site. If you ever have any question though, too, about maybe a page that you're working on, um, and if it's accessible or not, there, there is a free tool out there uh, and I can provide a link in the chat that um, it's, uh, uh, it's called WAVE, uh, but it's the web aim accessibility um, tool. And really what you do is you, you go to a web page. They have two different options, but the web page is the easiest. Um, you go to the, the website and you just um, paste in the URL uh, of the page that you want to have evaluated and it will provide you basically a breakdown of um, the overall accessibility. One thing I do want to mention though real quick is that a lot of the items um, that need to be reviewed have to be done manually. And that when you use an accessibility checker, even, even on a website, <clears throat> it, it may say everything's great. Um, but in fact, there are 
things that it cannot check. So if you have links and whatnot on, all across this web page that say, uh, click here, you know, for more information, click here and, and, and continually say that, that's a non-contextual link, it's technically not accessible. An automated, an automated checker will not pick up items like that. So, so it's still important to do a manual review um, of your content. Um, but yeah, when, when you get into things like the contrast, colors and things like that on a page, uh, an automated tool will, um, uh, will help you identify those items rather quickly. Okay, thanks, Rick. Uh, the next part is for course instructors. Um, and there's a number of items here ensuring that the digital materials and applications used are accessible, ensuring external course materials are accessible, provide timely remediation when required and procure accessibly. Procure accessibly comes up a lot. And I'd like to think in terms of going in the plan and when I think back of how we're helping instructors go about it, I go to the role of the faculty fellows and how you know, we're, we're really trying to go and um, put more of the culture inside uh, the unit so that people are responsible what they have and how to go about to do it and to give more, um, you know, access to people who can help and assist uh, to go in to do that. And we do that in a couple of ways, and that is the faculty fellows, and then, of course, with Kate uh having helping out with uh the remediation of the classes uh whenever whenever we have these online or the hybrid classes and the um you know really the education that we're really trying to do such as the next couple of days when i think of assessment and feedback too what i was thinking was uh how we use a tool like ally to go and to help and teaching faculty how to go and to utilize that tool will help them to help themselves and understand how accessible the content is. So I will let Michelle or Kate or Rebecca chime in here on anything they might want to add in terms of the roles and responsibilities of the course instructor. Uh, I'll jump in. <clears throat> so uh, the first thing I want to say is that if you're not sure what Ally is, um, this is built into all of our Blackboard sites. And I am giving a session about Blackboard Ally tomorrow and how to use it. And, and I really find that this has been one of the most helpful tools, um, both both for, I think, faculty members to see what's going on in their course, but also um, all of the features that automatically uh, help create alternative formats for students. So it's really, um, I think, helps out on both sides where it is directly sort of like providing alternative um, things for students, but then also really indirectly coaching faculty on how to how to make their their course sites in Blackboard more accessible. So um, I can't say enough about Blackboard. It's my it's my favorite thing that I've learned about since I've been a fellow. And um, and we'll be talking more about that tomorrow. But um, I guess I guess the last point that I, I want to make is that everything we're talking about, I, I feel like both um, it feels pretty big, right? Like there's all hands on deck, there's all kinds of people, all kinds of initiatives. And um, and I wanna encourage anybody that's, that's listening on this call, whether or not you're an instructor, um, whatever your role is, is that, um, that starting somewhere is the important thing, right? Is is understanding that that taking that first step of, of learning um, improves this for everybody. So even if you just, uh, are scratching the surface, don't know much about this, um, know that there is this huge net of, of resources and tools throughout campus um, to help really kind of pull this um, in, in the same direction. And so um, I think that that that's my that's my main point. But um, while this feels like this bulleted list, if I was a, a faculty member, I'd be like, oh my god, how do I ensure all these things? I don't even know what they are. Um, I think that there that's the whole point is that really the plan is trying to um, really kind of give certainly faculty um, those tools to be able to do these things, and it's really just about kind of starting down that journey. Go ahead, Kate. I'd like to add to um, to kind of piggyback off of what Michelle was just saying and Rebecca mentioned in the beginning that it, it takes a village and that all of you are part of this effort and initiative here at Oswego. Um, 
So first of all, I want to congratulate everyone who volunteered to come on this call today, because by showing up, that means that you're interested in improving in improving digital accessibility. Um, and again, it can be very overwhelming. Um, the culture shift is slow and learning is a slow process for accessibility because the whole is so incredibly deep in some ways. Um, but each semester we see more and more people that are involved. We get um, more and more people who are interested, who are reaching out and asking questions. Um, so we know that our efforts are being heard and that, that things are working, that can, as we go is continuing to move forward. Um, and so again, to just kind of reiterate what Michelle had just said, um, although it does seem like a big, huge mountain, there are tiny little steps that can be taken in order to um, make big impacts in order to continue to improve accessibility. So um, if you do get overwhelmed, reach out to someone and, and you know ask for a little bit of assistance and kind of breaking it down and bringing it back to the basics for you, because it is possible to do. Um, and you don't have to do everything all at once. Um, you don't have to go back and remediate every course material that you've ever made for the past 10 years. Um, but we're asking you to kind of start where you are and move forward and take little simple steps and, and we'll all get there together. And part of showing all the photos and things throughout this presentation is to just demonstrate how many people are actually available to help and who are working together to um, provide some of that support. Yeah, uh, well said all three of you. And it, it, I agree that it can feel overwhelming for sure. But once you learn the concepts uh, and, and the school and the skills and you see the tools you have to help you, I think, you know, you end up making more accessible content as you go. Um, and we do have, and we do understand it's going to take time. And this is where actually I like, I'm proud of the resources we put in the, in the help we've done. Okay, what's next, uh, Rebecca, course instructor? The last thing to remind everyone out about until, you know, and then we can have some um, Q&A. Uh, we left a lot of time for Q&A. We thought people might have questions about the process or who to get help from for certain things. Um, but as a reminder, we're offering accessibility office hours every day during breakouts from January 11th through January 22nd from 2 to 3 p.m. with the exception of Martin Luther King Day when we don't have breakouts. Um, and so that's an opportunity to drop in, ask questions, get help, and to connect with um, campus accessibility advocates. Um, even if you're just looking for like, I really care about this too and I wanna meet some other people who care about it, that's, you, can, you can do that during that time as well. Um, we'll have multiple people available um, and breakout rooms available for one-on-one -on -one help during that time. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. My computer is being silly. Okay. Um, and I want to open it up for if anybody has any um, questions, um, we can ask, you know, feel free to ask or um, what have you. Does anyone have any questions? Um, I have one. I so it's just it's a logistical question to keep track of all this stuff. Or you hear something in a seminar and you want to go back to it hypothetically, you know, four or six weeks later, and you go, I can't find the link that was in the chat about the wave accessibility tool, for example. So is there a spot on campus where these links where you can one spot you can go? Okay. There is Gene, and that's the accessibility website which okay. is um, oswego.edu slash accessibility. accessibility. And I'll, put that, okay. I'll put that in the chat so you have okay. it. Um, and you'll see that like every accessibility session. Oh, probably, <laughs> probably right in front of my face. And I just didn't know, but I, I struggled to find the link for this mo me meeting this morning. And I thought, oh boy, I got to get organized. Oh, but, in terms of the links for the cell yeah. workshops, I can provide that as well. I'll put that yeah. in the chat as well. Give me one I'm second. going to add actually that the accessibility link is available. If you go just go to oswego.edu and go down to the bottom, it's a, a it's a link that's available on every single web page on campus whenever you're on our site. Too. Probably saw it so much I didn't even see it anymore. <laughs> but but I'm also thinking about being part of the fellowship and just I need to get just want to have a way to think about being organized. Um, yeah, there's so much. I agree. Yeah, <laughs> it's easy to get lost. So I put um, this out breakout session um, links uh, in there as well, and they're all on one one page. 
So if you bookmark that one page, you can find all the links to everything. All the accessibility sessions are actually at the same link that you clicked on for today. Um, so if you know there's an accessibility one coming up, it will be at the same exact URL. Are there other questions or things that you want more information on? Rebecca, I'd like to just make a quick plug. Um, so even though the 10-day uh, challenge starts today, if you have not signed up for it and you want to be a part of it, um, we uh, can make that happen, certainly. Um, if, you, if you found that anything piqued your interest today and you've been wondering about that, right after this session at 1130, we have our kickoff to the 10-day challenge where we'll talk a little bit more about the structure and how that works. Um, as Kate mentioned earlier, there are... Um, upwards of 175 people across campus that are participating in the challenge. And that is faculty, students, uh, staff, and admin. We are so excited about the response. And um, the nice thing about the challenge is that it's super customizable, meaning that you can spend a little bit of time on it every day, a lot of bit of time on it every day, um, and really kind of pick and choose the things that are most applicable to you. So um, I think we can probably also plug into the chat. I'll see if I can hunt it down the link to sign up for it in case you have not done that. Uh, that is still open through the end of the day today. Great. Anything else that people want to bring up or have questions about or who to get help from on something in particular? This is an opportunity for us to kind of direct folks to specific people as well. I just uh, say, I think really the next couple of days, there's quite a few accessibility workshops coming up. Why don't you just highlight some of those too? Let me just bring up the count. So if we start looking just even uh, what's available this week, you know, oh, Michelle just mentioned um, the kind of challenge kickoff, but also at 1 p.m. there's an accessibility um, discussion group um, with, a, with a pretty short reading from accommodation to accessibility, creating a culture of inclu inclusivity um, so that can easily be read while you're eating a sandwich over lunch and join in um, at one o'clock if you're interested in that. There's our drop-in office hours today at two. Um, if you start looking at tomorrow, um, you'll see that there's a great workshop available on the universal design for learning. So faculty might be, in particular, might be really interested in that, and that's at 10 a.m. Still confused about what accessibility is? We've got you covered at 11 tomorrow. Uh, Ally is covered by Michelle at 1.30 tomorrow. We have our drop-in hours again. Um, and even if we look into Wednesday, just to kind of give you a feel for what's going on this week and kind of the extent that you can look for every single day. Um, at 10 a.m. on Wednesday, there's a session on Google Docs and Word and just structured content, which is one of the first main topics of our accessibility challenge. Um, that's like a, a how-to session, followed by a student panel um, at 11 a.m. Um, which is a really great opportunity to learn more about the perspective of students with disabilities. So there's plenty more every single day, right? There's like two or three every day. So if you just take a look at that schedule that I popped into the chat, you can see the wide range, but everything from technical to conceptual, we've, we've got it. All right. So if no one else has any additional uh, questions or comments, we really thank you for your attention and your time um, and hope to see you at many of the other accessibility workshops this week.